to the second annual Social Action uh, Lecture Series here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Marblehead. My name is Tony Toledo Buff. We're a liberal religious group. We've got this idea that has sprouted to have different people come over here and speak as a community service. Now, to me, it's very amazing that this woman standing here is able to call different folks. Last year, we had inaugurated our series with Howard Zinn and our delightful speaker tonight, Jackie had contacted, wrote letters, and he's agreed to come over. So to introduce our speaker, Jackie Wattenberg. This is going to be a night to remember. We've been waiting for this for so long. Professor Chomsky has spoken all around the world. There's hardly a country that he has missed in his speaking tours, or I should say has not invited him to speak there. And his books have been translated all around the world. He's an eminent professor of linguistics at MIT, as many of you know. His books are used in colleges as textbooks all around the world. As a matter of fact, my daughter uses textbook book in the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, his books are, are numerous. He's a prolific writer. Besides linguistics, he writes about, of course, political philosophy, uh, international affairs, public policy, the politics of oppression anywhere in the world. A sampling of his books, by the way, are right up here on the table. Afterwards, if you'd like to look at them and buy some, he will be willing to sign them for you this evening after the lecture. Uh, when his books are published, they're usually re uh, reviewed all around the world in many countries, such as Canada, England, Ireland, even Japan. There are two countries, though, that have been a little bit neglectful in reviewing his books through the years, the Soviet Union and the United States. <laughs> his honors are really too many to cite, but I'll tell you just a few. He has honorary degrees from the University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, University of London, in the Distinguished Science Award in 1984. He received the Kyoto Award in Japan in 1988, the George Orwell Award, and he has been the Bertrand Russell Memorial Lecturer at Cambridge in England, the Nehru Memorial Lecturer in New Delhi, the John Locke Lecturer at Oxford, and a Research Fellow at Harvard's Cognitive Study Center. Now, if you're like me, you may have been perturbed at certain things occurring in our country through the recent years, or through any years, the Vietnam War, the Panama War, the Gulf War, NAFTA. These things you are concerned about and think, well, it's sort of an aberration. Uh, it won't happen again. We'll just try to stop this. But since I've been acquainted with the writing of Noam Chomsky and hear him on tape and in, the, in the lectures, I realize that he has seen through his brilliant insights, a sort of large glowing arc that ties all the incidents together and really defines and glues the purpose <coughs> and the intent of all these actions. So I'm very happy that he's going to speak to us tonight on an exciting topic. We'll never know exactly what it is until he gets delves into it. Bringing the third world home, democracy and human rights in the new world order. Noam Chomsky. thing was going to tip over when I stepped on it. Uh, okay, yeah, I made it. <laughs> well, that uh, title was picked to be broad enough to include just about anything. Uh, and uh, maybe a good starting point is uh, human rights. Uh, there, at least, there's a well-accepted standard, so uh, codified, uh, in fact, universally accepted, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights passed by the General Assembly of the United Nations unanimously in December 1948, has the force of, recognized as having the force of law in the United States. Uh, furthermore, the United States has been uh, very prominent in defending the principle of the universality of the, uh, of the Universal Declaration. You'll recall last year there was a big conference in Vienna with a lot of publicity and uh, very impassioned rhetoric. Uh, the U.S. was taking the lead in defending the principle of universality against various backward third world countries that were claiming that uh, 
this was a, these were Western standards which didn't apply to them, and the U.S. was denouncing this cultural relativism and finally won a grand victory, and the Universal Declaration was again endorsed. Uh, that uh, rhetoric is rarely besmirched by any look at uh, what, the, what the text says, and it's an interesting text. There's a lot to say about it. Uh, for example, the, there are articles of the Declaration that have quite direct bearing on things happening right now, for example, in the Caribbean and in the Middle East. If there's time later, I could talk about that, but I'll just, time's short, so I'll just keep to some of the articles, parts of the Declaration that have a much broader significance and that tie in with the larger topics that I want to review a bit. Uh, so let's have a look first at uh, Article 25, for example. Article 25 says that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security of security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Well, that's Article 25, and I won't waste any time discussing how that principle is upheld in the richest country in the world with absolutely unparalleled advantages, so certainly no reason why it cannot be adhered to in full, a country that has a poverty level twice as high as any other in the industrial world, that has uh, millions of children suffering malnutrition uh, under third world conditions, uh, and other uh, phenomena that are familiar to you or that you can easily see by taking a walk in the nearest city. Well, that's Article 25, so we plainly are defending the validity of that one. Uh, so let's have a look at Article 23. It says, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Uh, with, uh, with equal pay for equal work and just and favorable re remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Uh, furthermore, everyone has a right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests. And so I remember this is 1948, so the reference to himself and his family uh, reflects the consciousness of that day, not this day. There's been some improvements. Uh, well, again, that's, uh, that's part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we uphold against all comers, uh, against third world countries with their cultural relativism, has the force of law in the United States. Uh, just take a look at the last part. Everyone has a right to form and join trade unions. Technically, there is such a right in the United States, but that's just a technical right. There's an array of legal uh, and other administrative uh, conditions which have essentially eroded that right, uh, and it doesn't in fact exist. In fact, the United States uh, was brought before the uh, International Labor Organization about two years ago and condemned for its violation of the right to form unions. It's very rare for the ILO to condemn an industrial country, it almost never happens. Uh, the, United, it, the United States was the only country at that time outside of South Africa in the industrial world uh, that allowed the use of strike breakers uh, to undermine the uh, permanent replacement workers, we call them here, scabs, in other words, to uh, undermine the right of workers to, uh, uh, to the rights guaranteed by Article 23. Uh, the, uh, that's, uh, the destruction of unions in the United States, which has proceeded quite significantly since the, since the 1930s, uh, that since, since workers finally run one in the 1930s, the rights that they had in most of the rest of the world and had, had for a long time, but that was very quickly eroded. Uh, and uh, by now, unions are reduced to fairly marginal phenomenon. And that's had a very significant effect. Uh, one effect that it's had is on lowering wages. So Lawrence Katz, who's the chief economist of the U.S. Labor Department, recently suggested that that's the main fact, that the destruction of unions is probably the main factor in the very sharp uh, reduction of wages that's taken place in the United States, uh, now to the lowest level in the industrial world. I'll return to that. Uh, the, uh, uh, another effect of the elimination of unions uh, is in violation of Article 23, is uh, just undermining of uh, democratic processes generally. 
Uh, unions are, after all, one of the few mechanisms by which uh, poor uh, people, ordinary people, can get together to advance their own concerns and interests in the political arena. Uh, when they do so, incidentally, that arouses uh, considerable uh, antagonism, even hysteria. That just happened a couple of months ago. <clears throat> I'll come back to that. It was an interesting incident. Uh, uh, aside from uh, reducing wages and undermining democratic processes, the, the <clears throat> elimination or marginalization of unions uh, has a kind of a psychological effect. It's part of a much more general and quite significant process of uh, privatizing aspirations, that is, of undermining the idea that you should have concern for others, uh, undermining a sense of solidarity and sympathy and uh, an idea that sort of, you, know, you were all in together, we have to work together. It's very important to atomize people and separate them from one another and privatize their, uh, their goals and aspirations for, as a technique of social control that's of great significance. Uh, and uh, undermining unions is one of many, uh, uh, many elements of that ideological offensive of which everyone is, should be, is or should be familiar. Well, uh, coming back to the uh, matter of uh, Article 23, everyone has the right to work and free choice of employment and so on, the International Labor Organization just uh, came out with a, uh, an analysis of the world employment situation. They estimate that 30% of the world's labor force is now unemployed as of January 1994. Uh, unemployed means, like maybe they can sell, you know, postcards at a street corner or something. But that means not enough, uh, 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 not enough work to uh, sustain uh, a uh, minimal standard of living. That's what unemployed means. So that's 30% of the world's labor force. Well, that's worse than the 1930s. They compare it to the great crisis, the crisis of the Great Depression. In fact, it's worse. Uh, it's one part of a huge human rights catastrophe, uh, which shows up in all sorts of ways. Uh, UNESCO estimated that about half a million children die every year simply from debt service alone, uh, repaying the, the debts are. Uh, the loans are from U.S. Or, and other commercial banks to their favorite dictators. Uh, when the debts go sour, they have to be paid for by the poor people of those countries and incidentally by U.S. taxpayers uh, because remember that the banks don't believe in the free market. Uh, they believe in it for others, but for themselves they believe in socialism. So when, the bad, when debts are bad, they're socialized in various ways and the costs are distributed over the general population. Uh, but in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, they pay, uh, and they pay for it badly, for example, with half a million children dying every year. Uh, 11 World Health Organization estimates 11 million children dying every year uh, simply from very easily tra tra treatable diseases, things like childhood diarrhea, which you could treat for a couple of cents. Uh, and they're dying because uh, the rich folk don't want to pay for it or don't even want to know about it. The head of the World Health Organization described that as a silent genocide, and indeed we would have absolutely no hesitation in describing those practices as genocidal if we could blame them on someone else. Uh, when we can blame them on ourselves, we don't talk about them. Uh, in Eastern Europe, since 1989, since it uh, uh, re returned to the free world, uh, the uh, one thing is free at least, there's been a free fall of the economy into deep third world conditions. Uh, UNESCO again came out with a report just recently estimating the human effects of the, what are called the reforms in Eastern Europe. Uh, they estimate that in Russia alone there's half a million extra deaths a year simply as a result of the reforms, comparable numbers elsewhere. Uh, the term reform is an interesting one. Refor reform is of course a good thing. If something's a reform, naturally everyone's in favor of it. Uh, and so those who might advocate a different way for these societies to be taken, drawn out of the Soviet tyranny. Uh, they are reactionaries or maybe communists or against reforms and obviously bad people. So that, uh, that issue is, is settled by mere choice of terminology. And if half a million people die a year from it in Russia, well, you know, it's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, there is something called a recovery going on in the United States, although it was announced by the government today that they're worried that it's going too fast, so they're going to terminate it. Uh, this is the Clinton recovery. It's about half the rate of normal recoveries, post-war recoveries. 
uh, and it's had about a third the rate of job growth uh, after the previous six recessions. Uh, among those jobs, uh, the jobs are also overwhelmingly low income jobs, so incomes of wages have continued to drop. Uh, furthermore, there's a huge number of temporary uh, employees. In 1992, about 27% of the new jobs were temps. Uh, the uh, uh, figures for uh, this April were just released. Uh, you sure saw them, they were front page stories, but you had to go down to the bottom about how wonderful the job creation was, though in fact much lower than after other post-war recessions. Uh, but in fact, the number of temporary jobs was still one out of six, and furthermore, they expected to continue that way. Uh, temporary jobs means uh, that's, it, uh, it does, uh, that's another good thing. That improves what's called the flexibility of the labor market. The technical term for it, flexibility, means is a fancy word for insecurity. It means you don't know if you're going to have a job tomorrow morning when you go to sleep at night. And that's a good thing, as any economist can explain. Uh, it improves what's called economic health. Economic health is a technical term that means things are good for profits, not necessarily for people. Uh, and in fact, for people, they're pretty rotten, but for profits, they're great. The uh, last uh, Fortune review of the welfare of corporations uh, was just glowing with praise for the uh, enormous increase in, in profits last year, again, even above the preceding year. So something's doing well. Uh, there's uh, 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 not only are have uh, wages been stagnating and in fact declining, uh, but in fact, but uh, the workload is also increasing. Uh, American workers did finally win a 40-hour week in the 1930s, but they lost it very fast. That's a thing of the past. Uh, by now, uh, Julie Shore, who's written some of the most recent economist at Harvard, who's done most of the work on this, uh, estimates that workers have to work about six weeks extra a year to maintain their 1970 salaries. And if you look at yesterday's figures, you'll again notice that the uh, average workload has reached new post-war heights. Uh, well, it's claimed that all of this has to do with uh, market forces. It's just inexorable kind of laws of nature. And then people, our economists, argue about whether the main effect is due to international trade or to automation. Those are the two uh, those are the two favorite candidates for the market forces that are causing all of this. Uh, well, that discussion is at best misleading and uh, at worst maybe verging on fraud in my opinion. Uh, if you look at the, these factors, trade and automation, let's say, uh, both of them are only in very small, in, in part, you could argue about what part, but in part at least, uh, 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 market phenomena. A trade, for example, is supposed to be efficient. Everybody learns that. Uh, but the efficiency of trade uh, is achieved by overlooking the fact that trade is highly subsidized. Uh, there's enormous uh, state expenditures that go into making trade look efficient with many market distorting factors. So simply to mention the most, just one of many, uh, trade, uh, the efficiency of trade depends on, tra on the, on the uh, cheapness of transport, of course. The cost of transport goes up, trade becomes less efficient. Uh, transport is kept cheap by vast government subsidies. Uh, highway systems, airports, uh, mari uh, you know, maritime, uh, uh, merchant marines and so on are all subsidized. Furthermore, the cost of oil is subsidized. Uh, the cost of oil, for example, is subsidized by the Pentagon. Uh, one of the main functions of the Pentagon has been to aim intervention forces at the Middle East in fact, its main target for intervention, uh, part of the general program of ensuring that the price of oil stays about where U.S.-based corporations and the U.S. government want it. Not too low, because then profits aren't good enough, but not too high, because that would interfere with the alleged efficiencies of trade. Well, you know, if you figure in the Pentagon, cost of the Pentagon to the costs of international trade, uh, things change a little bit. Uh, and they would change even more if you looked at what are called externalities, like the effects of pollution, uh, depletion, and so on. Uh, in fact, if, you, if anyone were really do an analysis of the cost of trade, it would be, uh, can't actually guess the figures, but it would be anything but uh, uh, the, the efficiency, alleged efficiency of trade would not be the result of market forces, that's for sure. What about automation? What's driving people out of work today? 
Well, automation is so grossly inefficient that it had to be developed through the state sector of the economy. A little secret that people don't say. Uh, but for about 30 years, uh, the automation, which is the, uh, the uh, automatic, uh, automated procedures which are now being used to undermine workers, uh, they were simply developed through the state sector. That means the Pentagon-based sector, uh, which is just the state sector of the economy, huge sector in the United States because nobody here believes in capitalism any more than they do anywhere else. Uh, the uh, uh, huge public subsidies were given to develop uh, automation to get it to the point where it could finally enter the market. Uh, that went on for decades. And furthermore, the form of automation that was developed uh, was designed uh, for purposes that had nothing to do with economic efficiency. Uh, automation was designed to be able to, uh, so as to de-skill workers uh, and to enhance managerial power. Now, there's nothing in automation that requires that. That's just a particular form of automation, uh, fulfilling certain class interests, certain power interests, which have nothing to do with uh, any economic factor. They have a lot to do with who, who rules uh, and who gives orders and so on, and there certainly are alternatives, but they were not pursued through the subsidized state sector that you and I pay for without being told about it. Uh, well, again, if uh, factors like that were worked in, uh, automation would look anything but efficient, uh, and the idea that people are losing their jobs or becoming de-skilled because, uh, uh, because of processes that have the validity of uh, you know, laws of nature would uh, very quickly deteriorate. In fact, uh, invocation of market forces should always be looked at with a very skeptical eye. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll notice to a large extent it's a kind of ideological warfare uh, for pretty obvious class interests. Uh, putting that aside, there are some facts. Uh, the fact is that people's lives are being destroyed by the billions, in fact, uh, through uh, through unemployment alone, putting aside many other factors. Uh, meanwhile, everywhere you look, you see plenty of work that ought to be done and that these people would be delighted to do if they had a chance. You don't have to have much imagination to look around you and find work that ought to be done. Uh, so here we have a situation uh, in which we have an economic system in which there are huge numbers of idle hands, maybe a third of the world's population, an enormous amount of work to be done. Uh, plenty of people want to do the work, but the economic system is quite incapable of putting together the idle hands of suffering people with the needs uh, uh, of work to be done. That's a brief way of saying that the economic system is a catastrophic failure, catastrophic when you look at the numbers. Uh, it is incapable of achieving elementary goals that any uh, economic system ought to aim for. Uh, well, that catastrophic failure is, of course, hailed as an enormous success. And indeed, it is an enormous success for a very small sector of the world's population, a sector of very privileged people. Uh, and that uh, sector happens to include the people who write the articles and uh, give the speeches. So naturally, they are hailing the enormous successes. Uh, but for the general population, of the world, and that's increasingly true here too, uh, the economic system is indeed a, a, uh, an incredible and indeed catas catastrophic failure. Well, market forces are only one aspect of this. Incidentally, people are well aware of it. So if you look at polls, even in the, I forget the third world where the disaster is uh, indescribable, uh, but in take say the United States, the richest country in the world, uh, polls here show that uh, one of the questions regularly asked in polls has to do with uh, assessment of the, of the economic system. In the most re recent, about a year ago, the Harris polling uh, results uh, in the, gave the figures of 83% of the population saying that the economic system was inherently unfair. Uh, similar figures in Britain, a little less on the continent. Uh, also very low expectations for the future uh, uh, in the industrial countries, remarkably so in fact. Well, market forces are only part of this story, though there's some part of it at least, uh, but there are some major tendencies in the last 20 years that underlie these developments and that are going to continue unless uh, something is done about them. And you can see pretty well where they're leading and where they're likely to proceed. Uh, one major tendency uh, is the shift that's, going, that's been going on in the past 20 years <clears throat> from basically national economies to a much more global economy. Uh, a lot of talk about that. 
and as there should be, it's an important phenomenon. And it has its consequences. Uh, one consequence that it has is uh, an increasing polarization worldwide, that is an increasing gap between rich and poor. Uh, that gap goes across countries, so the poor countries are getting falling way behind the rich countries, but even more dramatically it's happening within countries, the, across the world in fact, the gap in every, within every particular country, the gap between the rich and the poor is, uh, is increasing. And that's in fact a, a, a conse one consequence of the shift to a more global economy. Uh, another, shift, another consequence of this shift is the deterioration of uh, democratic processes throughout the world. Now, this is not uniform. There are some places, like, say, South Africa, where there was actually a, an improvement and uh, a step forward in democracy. But in most of the world, it's downwards, uh, including the industrial countries. Uh, and even, even though the forms continue to exist, their substance is deteriorating. And that, too, is a consequence of the globalization of the uh, uh, economic system. Uh, the mechanisms for all this are pretty straightforward. They're not very hard to understand. Uh, the uh, striking features of the present period are that capital has become very mobile. It's very easy to shift from one place to another. On the other hand, labor has become almost totally immobile. Uh, immigration barriers are barring the movement of people from one place to another, incidentally in radical violation of free trade doctrine. Uh, this uh, combination of uh, mobile, highly mobile capital and immobile labor, uh, notice first of all that's exactly contrary to the assumptions of classical economics. Uh, all the stuff, all the nice theorems about comparative advantage and all that pretty business is based on the principle that uh, capital is relatively immobile and that labor is highly mobile. If you change those assumptions, everything collapses. Uh, and that, those assumptions were fairly realistic at the time when classical economics was developed. So you go back to the days of, say, Ricardo, and it was true that capital was indeed relatively immobile. Capital meant mostly land, uh, and you can't move it. Uh, and when there, when there was any possibility of investing somewhere else, it was quite limited. So Ricardo's crucial assumption uh, that capital is immobile was more or less true. Furthermore, labor was highly mobile. Uh, the, uh, right here, in fact, after the native population here was exterminated or expelled, uh, it was possible to bring in huge numbers of uh, excess people from Europe, you know, my father, for example, uh, and uh, that's the mobility of labor, which indeed was a reality up until fairly recently. Not a very pretty reality, but a reality nevertheless. So those assumptions were sort of accurate, and therefore the theories had at least some relation to reality. By now the assumptions have been totally reversed, and the relation of the theories to reality has reduced quite considerably. Uh, but the consequences are very plain. Uh, with capital mobile and labor immobile, it's possible to shift production very easily to low-wage, high-repression areas, with, typically with low environmental standards. That's pro highly profitable and can much very easily be done. And it's also possible to play one national labor force against another. You can threaten to, do, to move production, and that suffices to lower wages, to increase job flexibility by uh, removing people from the permanent job market and so on. During the NAFTA debate, there was a lot of uh, talk about job loss and job flow and so on, most, most of which was meaningless because the economic models are nowhere near good enough to give any meaningful answers on those questions. And they were also beside the point because it doesn't take job flow to reduce labor, to reduce wages. The threat of, of moving elsewhere suffices. The threat that you'll move your factory somewhere else is enough to terminate uh, the demands of labor for, say, a decent wage or for benefits or for job security and so on. So even if not one job moves, uh, the NAFTA has its intended effect uh, of serving as a weapon against working people and against poor people and increasing the domestic polarization. And of course this is worldwide. Uh, every uh, capital in every country can do this. Uh, the effects of, uh, on reduction of democracy are equally obvious. Uh, the internationalization of production uh, just increases the power of transnational corporations, uh, which by now have an enormous uh, degree of, a couple of hundred of them have a tremendous degree of control over uh, uh, the international economy, how, you know, making uh, governments look 
small by comparison. Uh, and uh, what's happening is what happened in the days of a national economy. In the days of more national economies, national nation states developed with their own governing authorities <coughs> coalescing around domestic power, which in the last couple of centuries has meant mostly economic power. And now that's happening internationally. So power, is, uh, the power to make decisions over the economy is shifting to the transnationals anyway. But around them, there's, they're sort of spawning a, um, what the Financial Times of London, leading world's leading business newspaper, what it called the de facto world government, uh, an array of quasi-governmental institutions which are coalescing around the transnationals and serving their interests, kind of an image of what happened in the days of national economies in the nation state, but now on an international scale. Uh, this includes the IMF, the World Bank, the New World Trade Organization, and so on. And this array of this de facto world government uh, is drawing power away from uh, parliamentary institutions. Again, it's very straightforward. There's nothing secret about it. So let's say take the US and Canada, which had a so-called free trade agreement. Uh, the province of Ontario, Canada's largest province a couple of years ago, tried to uh, institute a, uh, an auto uh, a provincial auto insurance program modeled on the health insurance program, so a single payer auto insurance program in effect, which would have of course been highly efficient and would have lowered auto insurance prices, but uh, would have driven the U.S. insurance companies out of the market. Uh, so they threatened uh, uh, a, a suit uh, under the free trade agreement, claiming that this was uh, amounted to expropriation. It was an illegal interference with free trade. Well, if the province had agreed to litigate that, it would have gone, would have been extremely expensive, of course, and then it would have gone to some uh, secret panel uh, made up of uh, mostly corporate representatives, which would have adjudicated it, and you can guess how it would have come out. Uh, in any event, the province of Ontario, which is not a small entity, just withdrew the plan, and that's the end of the, uh, uh, the uh, single-payer auto insurance program. Well, that's one of the ways in which, in which people are losing their ability to make decisions. The people of Ontario can't have that because that's an interference with what's called free trade. That is the rights of private power, absolute unaccountable private power. Uh, these are the ways in which the shift to a transnational economy and its own governing institutions are intended to eliminate and narrow and restrict democratic processes. Uh, the same thing happened in Canada in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, one of the elements of these so-called free trade agreements is increased protectionism. They're highly protectionist agreements. Uh, the protectionism is one part of it is called intellectual property rights. That is increasing guaranteeing that uh, uh, big transnationals will monopolize the technology of the future, extending patents and uh, not only in time but also in character. We'll come back to that if there's time. Uh, one of the main aims is to try to ensure that the pharmaceutical corporations, which of course are publicly subsidized, there's plenty of subsidy for their research and development and so on, uh, but these publicly subsidized private profit corporations want to make sure that they monopolize the drugs of the future. Uh, Canada, one of the ways in which Canada was keeping its health costs down was by producing generic drugs at a fraction of the cost. Uh, and they came under threat, again, under the free trade agreement. In fact, even before the agreement was enacted, just the threat of enacting it was enough to get Canada to, term to reduce and finally terminate its, uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, production of generic drugs at a fraction of the cost, which shoots health care up, uh, reduces health, uh, but increases profits. Uh, when that happens in a place like Canada, it's sort of sustainable to rich country. But when it happens in India, as is happening now, then it's devastating. Uh, India has a fairly advanced pharmaceutical industry, which has managed to keep drug costs quite low. Uh, but they're losing it under the so-called because of the protectionist features of the free trade agreement, and they may lose it completely. In which case, drugs drug costs will shoot way up, and the effect of that in a country like India, you can readily imagine. Uh, in fact, it's bad enough so that the new GATT agreement is going to probably have to be ratified virtually at gunpoint in the Indian parliament. There's tremendous protest over this. Well, all of these things are understood with particular clarity in the third world, uh, where the loss of power to, transnational, to the transnational bureaucracies 
onto the transnational corporations where that loss of power is extremely obvious and very immediate in people's lives. It's a little more masked in the rich countries, but uh, in the poor countries, it's just too sharp to miss. And it's discussed a lot, in fact. So for example, in El Salvador, uh, in uh, January, there was a, this January, there was an important conference uh, organized by the Jesuits, uh, which had a lot of things to say about all kinds of topics. Uh, one of them, in fact, was about problems that are local there, not here, but there. Uh, the problem of the effect of long-term terror on the society, uh, the effect of what they call the culture of terror, uh, in, uh, in their words, domesticating the expectations of the population who come to uh, internalize and submit to the visions of the powerful and consider that the entire framework of thinking. That's the real effect of long-term terror and a major achievement of the United States, not only in El Salvador, but in much of the third world in these terrorist campaigns of the past years, which have simply domesticated people's aspirations, essentially lost hope. Uh, these are familiar features of slave societies as well. Aspirations are domesticated. You just internalize the assumptions of the master at some point. Uh, that'll happen in Haiti sooner or later if we can manage to keep the terror going long enough. Uh, this is one of the reasons, incidentally, why the U.S. is now willing to tolerate uh, formal electoral uh, uh, procedures in our backyard with aspirations domesticated. There's much less fear that you might have things like popular organizations with uh, broader aspirations. Well, uh, uh, apart from ma matters of quite great, but really third world type concern. They also dealt with the same conference, dealt with the issues that we're now discussing. The Jesuits made some points of considerable importance. I'll just quote them. Uh, their summary document said that Central America today is experiencing globalization as a more devastating pillage uh, than what its people underwent 500 years ago with the conquest and the colonization. And in fact, that generalizes to most of the third world and indeed to the growing third world population at home. Uh, and secondly, they pointed out that Central America, Central American states are being displaced by a strong new transnational state that dictates economic policy and plans resource allocation. That state consists of the IMF and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and USAID and so on institutions of a transnational state that has far greater influence than the market and diminishes whatever democratic parliamentary structures exist. Uh, that shift is another reason why the United States is now willing to tolerate formal democratic procedures. Uh, not only are people's aspirations domesticated by the efficiency of terror, uh, but the options available are also restricted. Uh, in small countries like El Salvador, again, the effect is overwhelming, but it affects the rich countries too. In fact, we just saw it this morning. Uh, the reason why the Clinton administration uh, decided to terminate the uh, slow uh, and very sluggish growth uh, is that uh, it scares bondholders. Uh, and they have such power over even powerful states like the United States that a mild stimulation of the economy is enough to cause the threat of a huge flight of capital, which even a rich country like this can't sustain. Well, that's the way in which uh, power in, uh, in, of parliamentary institutions, which are somewhat under popular influence, uh, is declining uh, in favor of unaccountable private power. Uh, these are very significant phenomena worldwide, even affecting rich countries like the US, as we have just seen. And this move towards a uh, more global economy has a lot of advantages. The new governing institutions that are arising, uh, first of all, operate in secret. Uh, nobody has the slightest idea what's going on inside, say, the IMF or the World Trade Organization. Maybe a few specialists know something about it. But as far as most of the population is concerned, it might as well be happening in complete secret. Nobody knows. And that's useful because that under, um, undermines democratic institutions. People don't know what's going on. Obviously, they can't do anything about it. So that's a big step forward in eliminating the threat of popular control over elite power, which is, of course, you know, a major, major battle for many years. 
uh, the power, in fact, is shifting into the hands of what we ought, if it was in the political realm, we would simply call totalitarian institutions. A corporation is essentially a totalitarian institution. It's, there's few, if any, human creations that, are, that have such strict uh, hierarchical structure, such strict authoritarian structure, structure, orders strictly from top down. You can insert yourself in them sometimes if, uh, and take orders from above and give them to below, but that's it. There's very little else. Uh, people on the outside have essentially nothing to say about it. These institutions are unaccountable. Uh, and absolutist in character and hierarchical, which is, of course, why they were very strongly opposed by classical liberals. <clears throat> Adam Smith was pre-capitalist. He barely saw them, though he didn't like the little bits that he saw. But Thomas Jefferson, for example, lived long enough to see the early stages of uh, what we call corporations. And he warned that they would form a, what he called a splendid aristocracy that would simply destroy the achievements of the American Revolution. Uh, and he warned against allowing what he called banking institutions and moneyed incorporations uh, to achieve power. Uh, the kind of power he was thinking about was minuscule as compared with what has happened, which goes beyond his worst nightmares. Uh, but the reasoning of classical liberalism was very clear. And in fact, their power was achieved not through parliamentary institutions, like Congress didn't give them those powers. It was done through judicial arrangements, through courts, uh, uh, judges, uh, lawyers, and so on, which essentially turned these totalitarian structures into uh, immortal persons, in effect, uh, by now with extraordinary power over uh, the world economy and, as I say, spawning their own governmental bureaucracies. Uh, a second effect, a second advantage of these developments is that they undermine markets. And that's important, too, because the rich want to be protected not only from popular pressures, but also from market discipline. Now, the, the, what's called trade now, uh, an enormous amount of it, is actually not trade at all by any, in any meaningful sense. It's just interactions internal to big corporations. So if a corporation happens in the course of production, happens to shift something from one plant to another and cross an international border, that's called trade. Uh, and that's not a small amount. So for example, more than half of US exports to Mexico uh, our trade in that sense. They don't enter the Mexican market. They're just transfers from one branch of a big corporation to another uh, to take advantage of uh, uh, extremely low labor costs, highly repressed labor, uh, low environmental standards, and so on, with all kind of price distortions and so on, all of them enormous market distortions, but in any event, not trade in any serious sense. And that's estimated to be something like 40% of world trade now. It's not small. So that's not trade at all. And as power shifts more into the hands of big transnationals, which gain an even greater, smaller and smaller number of them, gain an even greater control over the world economy, uh, that actually reduces trade in any meaningful sense, in any sense that has anything to do with market forces. Uh, it creates more and more uh, s uh, commercial interactions centrally controlled by a very visible hand. You know, there's nothing. No, nothing to do with market forces. These are managed interactions in a kind of what's sometimes been called corporate, corporate mercantilism. And a third advantage of these processes, as I mentioned, is they increase polarization. And that's very dramatic in the last several decades. So if you take the, the UN uh, development program figures, uh, comparing 1960 and 1990, so that's you know, a period in which these developments have been taking place, uh, the poorest 20% of countries uh, had the wealth of, had one thirtieth of the wealth of the richest 20% in 1960. That 30 to 1 ratio uh, changed to 60 to 1 uh, in, uh, it was 30 to 1 in 1960, it's the ratio is now 60 to 1. The changes internal to countries, however, are much more dramatic. So if you take the top 20% of population and wealth worldwide and the lowest 20% worldwide, the ratio of wealth held is 140 to 1 in 1990 and increasing. Uh, it's, it's striking in the rich countries too, particularly in the United States, uh, which is leading the way in this. Uh, in the United States, in the United States uh, wages have been sort of stagnating since about 1970 and actually declining uh, during the Reagan years. Uh, that decline reached uh, college-educated workers in 1987. Since 1987, college-educated workers' 
have been declining. That in part has to do with the, maybe in large part, has to do with the slight decline in the state sector of the economy, the Pentagon in other words. As Pentagon funding reduces, that reduces the state sector. We have an enormous state sector in the economy, though we don't call it that. Uh, and say GE, the big employer around here, is basically state subsidized. And as that declines, uh, that tends to mean that the wages of skilled workers and professionals and so on also declines, and that shifted in 1987. It's been going down since. I already mentioned the recovery. Uh, wages in the United States are now the lowest in the industrial world. Uh, well, actually, England got even lower. We were the lowest at the end of the Reagan years, but then England went even lower uh, after, uh, under the impact of Thatcher. So now we're the second lowest in the industrial world. In 1985, we were the highest in the industrial world. As you'd expect, we're by far the richest country. We ought to have the highest wages. Wages technically means labor costs per unit output, but essentially wages. Uh, the, this is the result of social policy, not market forces. That's why the United States and England are leading the way. They're very specific social policies. And they're considered also very good for economic health. So when these latest figures were announced showing that we were now 20% below Italy and 60% below Germany uh, in wages, uh, the Wall Street Journal was euphoric. They described it as a welcome development of transcendent importance. And indeed it is uh, for uh, the, for the rich. Uh, I mean, that's related to profits zooming uh, and to the society polarizing, of uh, taking on a third world aspect. And this is worldwide. I mean, continental Europe can't escape this uh, because their industrialists can do exactly the same thing that American industrialists are doing. In fact, Daimler Benz, the biggest conglomerate in Germany, uh, recently made a deal with Alabama to shift Mercedes Benz production there. And they got third world terms. Uh, the state of Alabama is going to, the taxpayers of Alabama, first of all, they got the land essentially free. Uh, the taxpayers of Alabama are going to build the infrastructure and give them the training programs and so on and so forth. And they can get very cheap labor as compared with Germany. Uh, so that's a weapon against German workers. That's a way in which they can harmonize everything downwards, you know, lower wages worldwide. Uh, the end of the Cold War uh, had a big effect on this. Uh, the end of the Cold War essentially returned most of Eastern Europe to what it had always been, namely the Third World. Remember, this is the original Third World. It goes back to pre-Columbian times, and it remained that way uh, until the Bolshevik Revolution and then the Russian takeover. In fact, in my opinion, that's basically what the Cold War was about. Uh, anyway, they're now back in the Third World uh, with Third World standards, and one of the effects of that is that they now have a very cheap uh, labor force available, uh, and that's understood. So if you read, say, the business press, Financial Times, they talk about, uh, for example, an article about a year ago called Green Shoots in Communism's Ruins. You know, the whole thing's a wreck, but there's some good things, green shoots. The green shoots are that there's a trained, uh, educated labor force, uh, also white, you know, blue eyes. I mean, none of that's problems. Uh, and they're very cheap. You can get them for nothing because they're desperate. Uh, they said the effect of the, the, the reforms has been the pauperization of the East European workforce, which means that you can now get workers at a fraction the cost of what they call the pampered Western European workers. Uh, so you can beat back down there, you know, these pampered workers in the West by simply moving to the East, just the way we go to Mexico and El Salvador and so on. Uh, Business Week chimed in with a good deal of euphoria about how this was a way to reduce the luxurious lifestyles of Western workers. Uh, by threatening to just move over to the east. Uh, now, of course, when corporations, have, when a corporation like, say, GM or VW or Audi and so on, when they move to Eastern Europe, uh, they expect protection. They don't believe in the market, remember. It's, the market is for the poor, not for the rich. So when GM goes to Poland or VW goes to the Czech Republic, they insist on and get uh, high tariff protection. Uh, and uh, uh, all other sorts of agreements which ensure that the costs are socialized and the profits are privatized. That's what states are for. Uh, this, in fact, as I say, is kind of the meaning of the Cold War. It was, in my view, mainly a, like a North-South conflict, an overgrown North-South conflict in which some part of the Third World tried to strike an independent course and was beaten back to where it belongs, into its service status. Uh, Grenada is not the Soviet Union, you know. So one you do in a weekend and the other takes 70 years. 
but the logic is very similar when you look at it, and a good deal falls into place when you, uh, when you look at it that way. In fact, you can learn a lot about the Cold War just by looking at who's cheering and who's complaining. Uh, and that's a good way to tell who won and who lost. So who's cheering, in fact? Well, very special sectors. Uh, one group that's cheering is the former Communist Party hierarchy. They're doing fine. Uh, they're the new uh, capitalist nomenclatura, they're sometimes it's called. W wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, you know, but now associated with Western international capital. Uh, uh, and uh, as the, these countries move to a third world status, the relative egalitarianism wasn't all that egalitarian, but by comparative standards, it was relatively egalitarian. That's shifting. And they're getting the same structure as any other third world country, very you know, super rich sector, which you find in every third world country, very privileged, you know, un indescribably wealthy, usually connected with their serving international capital. They've got it too. And by and large, it's the old Communist Party apparatus. So they're the victors of the Cold War. They didn't lose. They won. Their population's lost. I mean, half a million people are dying every year in Russia. They lost. Uh, but the, the hierarchy, the, uh, they won. The rulers won. Uh, what about the West? Same story. You know, the, the uh, Western European workers who were getting their luxurious lifestyles beaten down by the methods I just described, they didn't win the Cold War. They lost it. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, corporations whose profits are going up, they won it. Uh, and if you think that through, you find out pretty quickly what the Cold War was about. Uh, very different than what it's described as, but pretty clear. Uh, we are now seeing very dramatically the continuation of a long tradition, the tradition being that markets are for the poor. Uh, state power and protection is for the rich. Uh, the rich have never been willing to subject themselves to market forces. Uh, the idea that you know, modern indus industrial societies developed through market forces, complete myth. Uh, you go back to England and the United States and the late developing societies, every single case was uh, based on extensive uh, and radical state intervention and protectionism, but for the rich. Now, the poor were indeed subjected to market forces. And that's the, I mean, the long whole story is more complicated than that, but that's the primary one, and we see it today. So, for example, when uh, Sometimes it's, it's dramatic. Uh, after the NAFTA victory, you'll recall that Clinton went off to the Asia-Pacific Summit meeting where there was another triumph in Seattle, and uh, he, he elaborated what was called his grand vision of the free market future. And he picked as the model for his grand vision uh, the Boeing Corporation, uh, that which is the major US exporter. So that's the model for the free market future. And the grand vision indeed was given, and a speech was given in a hangar of the Boeing Corporation. Well, that's a perfect choice. I mean, the Boeing Corporation is a, is a prototypical example of a state-subsidized, publicly protected corporation where the profits are privatized. Uh, in fact, that's true of the whole aeronautical industry, transparently, in fact. Uh, the, uh, uh, aeronautical industry never it was certainly was not it could barely survive before the Second World War. During the Second World War, the Boeing Corporation did enrich itself through wartime profiteering uh, by by using the opportunity of war. They were able to enormously increase their profits, and they ended up quite a wealthy corporation thanks to American taxpayers. Uh, uh, after the war, however it was recognized that they could not survive in a commercial market, neither they nor any the rest of the industry. Uh, Fortune magazine, for example, pointed out in 1948 that the aeronautical industry cannot survive in the commercial market. Therefore, the public is called upon, once again, to subsidize it. Uh, and that's the way it develops. Uh, uh, the, just, just the plain sale of airplanes is primarily to the state market, the public market through the Pentagon. But the same is true of, uh, of the fundamental research. Uh, and development, the avionics and uh, metallurgy and so on. That all comes from public funding, and then if there's any profit to be made, you hand it over to profit in private enterprise. So, and it goes on right till today. I mean, the choice of Boeing as the vision of the free market future tells you exactly what the free market is about, and the willingness of the commentators to suppress these truisms tells you something about what the ideological system is about. Well, that story actually goes back to the origins of the Industrial Revolution and continues without change and runs through these recent uh, so-called trade agreements. Uh, NAFTA and GATT are not free trade agreements. 
these are investor rights agreements with a kind of a mixture of uh, protectionism and liberalization carefully crafted to meet the needs of the powerful. So for example, GATT, say, uh, excludes uh, military expenditures. It cuts down, it, it eliminates, it rules against subsidies. You're not allowed to subsidize industry, but military expenditures are excluded. Well, that's our main technique of subsidy. The main industrial policy in the United States, the main technique for maintaining high technology industry is subsidizing it through the military system. So naturally that's excluded from GATT. That remains legitimate. Uh, the, uh, I already mentioned things like the inefficiencies of trade. Uh, intellectual property rights uh, extend protection. Inter instantly they extend it in very interesting ways. It's not only the length of a patent that's extended, but also its nature. So patents used to be process patents. I mean, it was a particular process of manufacturing something that was patented. Uh, GATT changes that to product patents. It's the product that's patented, which means that say if, you know, if say Merck Pharmaceutical get, develops a new drug, which mostly you pay for, but they develop it and they now get patent rights for it, it means that India can't work out a cheaper way to produce the same drug because it's the product that's patented, not the process. And that goes on for 20 or 40 years. Uh, well, that's very important. Uh, again, it has nothing to do with efficiency. In fact, what it does is cut down on technological innovation, obviously. If you can't, it, it makes it useless to work out cheaper ways to produce things that are already patented, so therefore nobody's going to do it. So it cuts back on efficiency, cuts back on, on, on development, but increases profit and increases polarization, because it's going to keep drug prices high in India. Well, that's, uh, that's what's called free trade in GATT. Incidentally, there's a history on this, uh, which if people couldn't figure it out, they could look at. So in the 19th century, there were a few countries that did have patent, product patents, France, for example. And part of the reason why France lost its, its chemical industry was the fact that they had product patents. So therefore, the industry shifted over to Switzerland, which didn't have them. That's why Switzerland has a big chemical and pharmaceutical industry and France doesn't. It's well known parts of economic history, but the logic is obvious and the idea is to perpetuate it, but now on an international scale. So there's no shifting anymore because it's now global, not national. And finally, the rich countries never accepted these laws when they were developing, the United States, for example, but we do impose them on the poor. Uh, this is not markets, remember, this is protection. And the whole business is some kind of mixture which is designed to transfer more and more power over to the transnationals and their quasi-governmental institutions uh, and to increase the polarization. And incidentally, that is recognized. So it takes, say, NAFTA, you know, a huge debate about NAFTA, a lot of irrelevant discussion about job flow, which, as I say, nobody knew anything about. But it was interesting that there was an undercurrent of agreement on both sides, namely that whatever the effect on job flow, it was going to polarize, meaning for the majority of the population in all three countries, it would lower their wages, and for the rich, it would improve uh, their incomes, so split, split more. Uh, the New York Times, which is very pro-NAFTA, uh, did run an article on this. Uh, the, f the day after the NAFTA vote, when it was all safe, uh, they ran their first article on the expected effects of NAFTA in the New York region. And it was a very upbeat article about how great it was going to be. Uh, and they went through all the people who would gain from it, primarily financial services like, you know, bankers and corporate lawyers and PR firms and that sector. They'd do fine. You know, in fact, they were all just salivating with joy. Uh, and, they, uh, and some industry would do well, particularly uh, uh, capital intensive industry like, say, chemicals they do well, and the publishing industry, like the New York Times, which is helped by the protectionist elements of NAFTA, they do fine. Uh, then they have a sentence in which they talk about the losers. They say, well, you know, can't, everything isn't perfect. Some people have to lose in the free market. Uh, and the losers, they said, would be uh, women, blacks, uh, Hispanics, and semi-skilled workers, which happens to be about three quarters of the workforce. So they're the losers. Uh, but meanwhile, the corporate lawyers and the bankers and so on, they would be doing just fine. Uh, this is, remember, a city where 40% of children live below the poverty line, uh, meaning they are cut out of any future just through malnutrition and uh, lack of education and so on. And now that will be increased. That was part of the great achievement of NAFTA. You can understand the, uh, 
enormous euphoria about it and the uh, tremendous excitement in uh, the circles that do the writing and the talking and the preaching and so on and so forth. Yeah, they'll do great. Most of us will, in fact, do well, I presume. But most of the population will do very badly, and they know it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and the population knew it, too. Uh, there was, it was, the NAFTA was expected to sail right through in secret, but there was a quite unexpected popular uh, uh, re reaction to it, uh, led particularly by the labor unions. And it was very interesting to see the reaction to that. Uh, that led to, you remember, this is now last November, uh, there was real hysteria about that. Uh, Clinton uh, was giving speeches featured on the front page about what he called the naked pressure and the raw muscle of the labor unions, uh, pleading based on friendship and threatening based on money and work in the campaign when they approached their elected representatives. Absolute outrage for working people to go to their elected representatives and say, look, here's what we'd like you to do. Uh, months later, the Times is still running articles uh, bewailing what they call the bullying from the labor organizations to try to, uh, to, try to get their representatives to do what they wanted. Uh, Anthony Lewis, you know, way out on the dissident left, uh, was uh, denounced what he called the backward, unenlightened labor movement with its crude, threatening tactics as it approached, uh, you know, its elected representatives. The day of the vote, House vote, there were editorials in the major papers, including the Times and the Post. Uh, uh, the Times editorial listed the Congress, people, people from Congress in the New York area who, had, who were planning to vote against NAFTA, and it had a little box in there in which they listed the contributions to them from labor PACs. And they said, this is ominous signs, you know, it looks like they're not really voting honestly, they're being pressured by their, uh, you know, by, by this bullying. Uh, uh, some of these aggrieved representatives later wrote in letters saying, well, what about the corporate contributions? We got a lot more from corporations, how come you didn't list them? Uh, and uh, how come, for nobody asked, but they could have asked, uh, how come that the uh, Times didn't list the, say, advertisers in the New York Times and what they thought about NAFTA and maybe recognize some ominous signals there. Uh, but the point is, and of course, in fact, the day after the NAFTA vote, the Times did have an article comparing corporate lobbying and labor lobbying. Uh, after all this screaming about labor's power, they said what was obvious, that labor lobbying was trivial and insignificant as compared with corporate lobbying, which is, of course, obvious. Again, that was the day after the vote. Uh, but in a sense, you, c you can't really criticize them for this. Uh, corporate lobbying isn't worth reporting. I mean, that's like reporting the fact that we breathe air. You know, that's the way this, it's not news. Uh, it's the labor lobbying that had to be reported. Uh, the fact that the wealthy are twisting the arms of their representatives, that's just the norm. That's the way the system's supposed to work. It's, after all, supposed to work for the rich. Uh, it's when poor people try to get involved in the public arena that you have complete hysteria. Uh, and that reaction, in fact, ref is very revealing about the elite attitudes towards democracy, all the way over to the liberal left. Uh, the public is supposed to be watching. They're not supposed to be participating. None of these crude, threatening tactics, like uh, calling a representative and saying, I'd like you to do this and that. Uh, that's to be left to the business representatives uh, who own the place and are supposed to run the political system. Uh, well, uh, let me just mention a last uh, factor that uh, in, the, in the global economy, which actually got a little publicity after when Richard Nixon died a couple of days ago. Uh, Nixon's major achievement in terms of its long-term impact was to dismantle the uh, post-war economic system, the Bretton Woods system, which regulated currencies. The, after the Second World War, the United States was essentially set up as a kind of an international banker. The dollar was the international currency. The dollar was fixed against gold and other currencies against the dollar. Uh, and that was extremely advantageous to American business for a long period. In fact, that was the basis for the development of the post-war multinational corporations. It gave them an enormous capacity to spread through the world. But by around 1970, when Nixon came in, that was not sustainable any longer. Uh, the other industrial countries had developed after the war. Germany and Japan had developed. It was now kind of like a tripolar economy. Uh, the Vietnam War had been very costly to the U.S. economy and quite beneficial to its rivals who made a lot of money on it. Uh, and in any event, the US, Nixon felt probably rightly that the U.S. could not play this role any longer. And since we're the biggest guy on the block and do what we feel like, he simply dismantled, called the game off, dismantled the post-war economic system. 
uh, and uh, that opened the period of unregulated capital, which just had enormous effects. Actually, there's a front page article about it in the Wall Street Journal today, uh, which is accurate. Uh, they, uh, uh, it describes a commission run by Paul Folker, the former head of the Federal Reserve, uh, which is trying to reconstruct this system, describing some of the effects that it's of the, the dismantling of it has had over the 20, last 25 years. And one effect they point out, which plenty of other economists have too, uh, is that it shifted ca it, the composition of capital to speculative rather than productive uses. And that, to that they attribute the fact that uh, the growth rate has been about half since 1970, about half of what it was before 1970. In fact, if you look at what happened in this period, what Nixon did is only one element, but there were several others. But the effect has been to vastly increase the amount of unregulated international capital. Uh, it's now es estimated by the World Bank at about $14 trillion, totally overwhelms national governments. And it can be moved very fast because of modern telecommunications. So maybe a trillion dollars or so moves from one market to another every day. The national governments can't resist that. That's part of the reason for the, you know, the cutting back of this the Clinton decision to cut back the uh, uh, the mi minor growth rate. Uh, the uh, uh, but not only has the has there been a huge explosion in the amount of capital, but it's also completely changed in composition. So in 1970, before Nixon did this, it was about 90% about of the capital in international transactions was for long-term investment in trade. In other words, something more or less productive, 10% for speculation. And by 1990, those figures had reversed. It was 90% for speculation and 10% for trade and investment, with an obvious effect on things like growth rates or on national economic planning, which simply becomes impossible because the unregulated financial capital is looking for stable money, meaning no growth. Okay. Uh, and all of this has been driving the world into low growth, uh, low wage, high profit uh, equilibrium of some kind. Uh, 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 and that is a, a, this all combines with the internationalization of production and simply accelerates it. Well, all of this stuff, just to end, has a resemblance uh, almost an eerie resemblance at some time, in some ways to what was happening in the early 19th century. Now, the early 19th century, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it was basically England. It wasn't global. You know, you could see it right in the British Isles. Uh, and what was happening was quite interesting. It was very similar to what's happening around the whole world today. And if you look at the outcome of that, it's suggested. Uh, that's the time when the ideologies that are rampant today were developed. They, you know, neoliberal ideologies and so on. That's classical economics. It was developed in the early 19th century, barely changed since. Uh, and uh, 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 the idea of it was to use, it was developed basically as a weapon of class war. Uh, the idea was to try to destroy the pre-capitalist mentality and economy and to create the basis of a wage labor system. Now, the pre-capitalist, in, in say a feudal system, everyone had some kind of a place it might have been a miserable place, but it was some kind of place. And you know, the system was arranged, so you had your place. Uh, and the pla along with that place went a right to live. Actually, it was called that. Uh, so you had a right to live in your perhaps utterly miserable and degraded status. Well, that's incompatible with capitalism. Capitalism requires elimination of the right to live. Your rights should be exactly those that you get on the labor market. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, that's the ideal. Of course, not for the rich, remember. They have powerful states working for them. But for the general population, uh, you get the rights. You, you have no human rights. Human rights are zero, except what you can gain on the labor market. Uh, and it was extremely important to eliminate what was called the deception of the poor. Ricardo called it deceiving the poor. He's the great you know, creator of this system. You deceive the poor by letting them believe that they have some right to live over and above what they get on the labor market. Uh, Malthus, who was another major figure, uh, argued in very influential work that if you, if you don't have independent wealth uh, and you can't earn enough on the labor market to sustain yourself, then go somewhere else. You have no right to anything. And go somewhere else meant at that time, well, you know, go to the place where we have uh, uh, exterminated the native population, so there's a lot of free land. Uh, that's, uh, 
uh, that was, that's classical economics. Uh, you want to drive the population into the labor market or the workhouse prison. It was recognized that some people wouldn't be able to sustain themselves, so you don't want them to die in the streets, you know, smells too bad, and so on, so put them in a workhouse prison. So they either go into the labor market, where their rights are whatever they can gain, or they go into the workhouse prison. Uh, all of this was demonstrated with, as Ricardo put it, with the certainty of the principles of gravitation. These were just laws of nature, and you don't want to deceive the poor into thinking that they have any other rights, and then comes all the familiar stuff about uh, capital accumulation and trickle down and so on that you, know, you hear every time you, open your, you look at the newspapers. Uh, every time the New York Times presents a, what they call a primer for the, an economic primer for the population, it's just recapitulating all of this stuff. Well, by the 1830s, uh, the rising industrial classes had gained enough political power so they could ram these laws through. Uh, they eliminated what were called the poor laws, you know, the welfare system. And in fact, the arguments are very similar to the kind of arguments that are going on today about eliminating welfare. Uh, people have no right to sustenance. Contrary to what it says in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they don't have those rights. Maybe they're on paper, but we don't believe any of that. We believe that they have no right to live, none of those rights that are listed there, and therefore the system, of, the system by which the community saves, you know, gives people the right to survive, say children, that has to be dismantled. You have only the rights you get on the labor market or the workhouse prison, uh, and uh, we are now reliving that. Uh, the poor laws were dismantled in the 1830s, uh, and what happened? Well, what happened was interesting. Uh, the general population didn't accept the conclusion that they had no right to live. Uh, for several decades, the British Army was mostly involved in putting down riots. Uh, then came the beginnings of organizing, you know, the beginnings of the Chartist movement and then the early socialist movement. And at that point, the rulers got scared. Uh, well, you know, the, they recognized that pretty soon the rabble might uh, also question their right to rule. Uh, okay, they don't have a right to live, why do we have a right to rule? You know, we'll question that, and then you're really in trouble. Uh, also, the wealthy recognized for themselves that they needed to appeal to powerful state intervention to protect themselves from market disaster. Uh, well, you know, by the middle, middle of the 19th century, the science of economics changed. Uh, and now, the, with the certainty of the principle of gravitation, everyone was opposed to laissez-faire. Uh, Laissez-faire, in fact, became a bad word for about a century until it was revived in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, the, you get John Stuart Mill, Principles of Political Economy, which is basically social, social democratic. You know, it's kind of the, you know, the fundamentals of what later became the European welfare states. Well, that's what happened at that time. Uh, what's happening now? What's happening now is I think we're in a similar situation, except it's global. Uh, there's a kind of an experiment going on to see whether you can eliminate human rights for the overwhelming majority of the population of the world and drive them into either the labor market, where they'll get whatever rights they can get, none if they can't get any employment, and now there's nowhere for them to go. You know, maybe Mars or something, but there's nowhere for them to go, uh, unlike the 1830s. Uh, and for the rich, you'll have powerful states, uh, all sorts of protectionist measures and so on, Production will be by the super poor and the most exploited. You move it around from one place to another. And the markets will now be the wealthy sectors throughout the world. Uh, nobody knows if that can work or whether the population will accept it. Uh, we're sort of spearheading it here. Uh, that's why you find uh, the sharp reduction of wages, this uh, develop, you know, welcome development of transcendent and importance. And you also find the uh, double, you know, the doubling of the poverty level as compared with uh, any other country, and also, crucially, the uh, sharp increase in prisons. The United States now has by far the largest prison population and is increasing prisons. Uh, the couple of days after the NAFTA vote, the Senate passed the most onerous crime bill in history, then made even worse by the House, uh, which calls for huge new federal expenditures simply to throw more and more of the population into prison. And those will sooner or later be prison workhouses. In fact, U.S. prisons already are exporting overseas. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I think you have this natural move towards the labor market, and if you can't survive the prison workhouse, uh, for much of the population, they just become superfluous, like most of the 
third world populations. Meanwhile, in a country like this, there's ample sectors of privilege to which people like us belong. Uh, and uh, the question is, the experiment is, can this survive or will it lead to exactly the result that it led to in the 1820s? Uh, riots, organizing, challenging of the right to rule, uh, moves towards uh, a more humane social order, which was finally to some extent achieved and has now, is now being dismantled as the whole thing is recapitulated on an international scale. In my opinion, that's the moment that we're now in. And there are conflicting tendencies, as there always have been. And the question of which, one, which ones dominate will uh, very much determine uh, you know, whether there's uh, any kind of a livable future. Well, while you're, just one brief comment on this. I do have a daughter and, in fact, a grandson who live in Nicaragua, and we go down there, you know, every couple of months. Uh, and the, the situation is, in fact, you know, really amazing. I mean, through the early 1980s, the Nic Nic Nicaragua had developed quite a successful, let's just keep to health, uh, since this is what's under discussion, they developed quite a successful health care system. There were rural clinics, uh, the uh, child infant mortality rate was going down and so on. Since 1990, since the elections, all of that is dismantled. It's all collapsing. Uh, the hospitals are closing down. Actually, they're separating. It's becoming a third world country, meaning if you're rich, you can get anything. And for most of the population, there's nothing. Uh, my daughter uh, was riding a bicycle and uh, had, it was hit by a, actually bumped into a bus or something, fell down and broke her collarbone. So she was taken to a public hospital. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the medical care was okay. I mean, these are trained doctors. In fact, they've had a lot of experience. Thanks to us, uh, the Contra War gave them plenty of experience in having to put together broken bodies. Uh, so technically, the medical care was okay. But, for example, she, uh, she wanted a glass of water. Uh, and the nurse asked her, did she bring a cup? because they don't have cups. You know, you want a glass of water in the hospital, you bring your own cup. Uh, if you stay overnight, you bring your own sheet. You know, if you're lucky, if you can get a bed. Uh, if um, by now they, you know, they're not even washing the floors. I mean, they, it, the whole system is utterly collapsing. And this is extending all over the country. So you'll recall, those of you who are around, I think, old enough 10 years ago, that uh, there was nothing more inspiring 10 years ago than the laments over the fate of the Mosquito Indians. Uh, when a couple of dozen of them were killed uh, in the course of uh, Sandinist operations during the terrorist war that we were waging against them. This was uh, condemned all over as genocide, literally, uh, the worst human rights violation in the hemisphere. I mean, this is the time when we were supporting the slaughter of tens of thousands of uh, Indians right next door. But this was you know, the human crime of the century. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Jean Kirkpatrick and editorial writers and so on. Well, that was 10 years ago. Last time I was down there, the, there's an evangelical church group, which is one of the last remaining groups that does any human rights work and medical work down there, uh, evangelical Protestant group that works in the mosquito areas, and they re were reporting last time I was down there that 100,000 mosquitoes are starving, 100,000 people, mostly mosquitoes, are starving. Starving, you know. Well, sure, that's the effect of the uh, onerous conditions that we've imposed on the country. I don't hear anybody complaining about it. That's okay. That's not a human rights violation. And it reveals, again, the purely instrumental character of human rights in the official culture. If you can use them as a weapon to beat somebody over the head, fine. Uh, if it's just human rights, we don't care, especially if we're responsible for it, as we are in this case, then we plainly don't want to hear about it. Uh, uh, Nicaragua is declining about, it's still above the level of Haiti, but not much. It's now the second poorest country in the hemisphere. The World Bank and the IMF, which are basically U.S. instruments, are imposing extremely onerous conditions on them, 
in fact forcing them to cut back what little remains of, say, public health care and so on. Uh, in my view, this is all just pure torture. I don't think it has any purpose whatsoever except to teach other people, uh, and other people understand it, even if Americans don't, that you don't step on the toes of the big mafia don. In fact, any mafia don would understand this very well. I mean, if somebody in your neighborhood doesn't pay protection, you don't just break his bones, you know. You really do a job so that the other people understand, and that's the way we treat the third world. Uh, we're the mafia don. Nicaragua tried to follow an independent course, and now they're going to suffer, like Cuba or anybody else who stands up, and they're going to suffer for a long time. And that will happen as long as we let it happen. Uh, nobody knows about it here, it's kept out of the newspapers, but they know about it there, and they know about it elsewhere in the third world. And that's part of the reason there is such uh, despair. That's part of this uh, culture of terror that the Salvadoran Jesuits were talking about, now carried out through economic measures, and you know, no less destructive for that reason. If the American solidarity organizations, which were very impressive in the 80s, if they can get their act together, uh, they're very badly needed now. I think more needed than they were in the 80s because the tortures throughout the region is more subtle perhaps than it was then, but very real. And there are popular organizations that somehow survive and can fight back, but they need outside support and that can only come from here. Thank you very much. In case some of you felt you were a little bit low on funds this evening, you can bring money or send it to the church here, made out to the church for Nicaragua also, please. Uh, we just have a few questions asked by the audience. Yes, sure. Charles, do you want to uh, oh. uh, handle the question oh. period, please? Okay. Our minister, Reverend Charles Wilson, will take a few questions. Well, um, if you want to write them down, no, I, you just want to yeah. volunteer by... Uh, sure. People just talk. Just, just call up. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You want to recognize people? Yeah, sure. It can be easier. Yeah. Um, I'm involved with fishing industry. The fishing industry has been devastated. I wish you would address the, cap the, the devastation of the resources of the world and the effect of that devastation on this 100 million increase in population in Europe. We doubled, first billion doubling was in the 50s, now we're at 5 billion. That effect, would you put that equation into Europe? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> you know, uh, a, a business corporation is not a humanitarian institution. Uh, it can't be. And it's not because they're bad people running it. Uh, in a mild, you know, we don't have a real competitive system, but a partially competitive system, anyone who wants to stay in the game has to try to maximize short-term benefit. Otherwise, you don't stay in the game. Uh, and one of the ways you maximize short-term benefit is by disregarding what the economists call externalities. Uh, things like resource depletion. Somebody else will worry about that. It's kind of like pollution. You know, somebody else will worry about that. Resource depletion, somebody else will worry about it. We're trying to maximize profit for tomorrow. Uh, you see it in the fishing industry, but it takes place all the time in the most incredible ways. I mean, take, say, oil, you know, the major commodity in, in the modern world, you know, in the modern industrial world. The U.S. used to be a major oil producer. Uh, in fact, how much time have we got with this depletion of resources? How much time do we have? How much time? Nobody knows. Uh, I'm t let me just mention what happened with the oil industry. We can see it in the last 20 years. U.S. was a big oil producer back in the 1950s. Everybody, all the oil industry knew perfectly well at the time that the major oil resources were in the Middle East and that by comparison the U.S. resources were rather limited. However, it was more profitable in the short term to sell U.S. oil and to keep Middle East oil as a reserve. So they depleted American oil. I mean, that's why there's no oil in Louisiana anymore. And we're now, in fact, importing oil from the Middle East to pour down holes here to build up reserve. There's no surprise about this. Everybody knew all this in the 1950s. It's just that short-term profit required that you deplete U.S. oil uh, and uh, save Middle East oil owned by the same corporations as a reserve, and you know that's the way you build profits. Doesn't make any sense for the population here or for anybody, but does make sense for profits. And the same is true of fishing. So now uh, uh, the, the area around here, which used to be the richest fishing grounds in the world, has been you know you know better than I, largely depleted, and we're now doing the same thing elsewhere. So one of the Chile, for example, is described for the moment as an economic miracle. 
part of the reason is they're just ripping off their resources. There's, it's mostly a resource produced, primary product producing region, including fishing. So there's extensive overfishing of the waters off Chile, and it'll last as long as it lasts, and when that's gone, so, you know, do something else. Uh, if you're part of the uh, system of, if, if, the, if, if the entire economic system is designed around the principle of maximizing short-term profit for the rich, this is exactly what's going to happen. How much longer do we have? Nobody knows. Uh, it's, um, I mean, agricultural, uh, U.S. agribusiness is what's called efficient, but again, efficient because nobody counts the externalities. For example, there's been a huge reduction in productivity of the soil. You know, it's being destroyed by pesticides and overfarming and so on, but that's somebody else's problem. You know, well, don't worry about that in the next generation. Well, you know, if we let that happen, the next generation is going to have insoluble problems. Uh, you, you paint the almost completely bleak uh, picture uh, from a global uh, conspiratorial perspective. There's nothing conspiratorial about it. This is just like trying to maximize, it's just like your corporation trying to maximize profit. That's not a conspiracy. I don't necessarily uh, conspiratorial in a classic sense, but yeah. this kind of uh, inevitable quality you can speak about. Uh, is there anything positive that you view in this uh, scenario, apart from, uh, I guess, what you see as a possible replication in the uh, yeah, that's exactly. of the uh, 19th century rebellion? Absolutely. It seems to me that that's less likely in the kind of uh, system you postulate, because now it's a global process, yeah. where there is no America to escape to or whatever. I guess my point is, is there anything in your view here which is positive in any Sure. I mean, we're much freer. Like, we have a lot more freedom than anybody had in the 1820s. I mean, for example, in the 1820s, there was a very limited franchise, remember. I mean, now, you know, the franchise has been won. Uh, the right of freedom of speech has been won. It didn't exist then. Uh, there's all, there was no slavery anymore. There used to be uh, at that time. I mean, there's all sorts of freedoms that are available and opportunities that are available that weren't available then. Furthermore, there's just a lot more resources available to all of us. Uh, which means that the possibilities of reacting are far greater than they were for impoverished uh, farmers and slaves back in the 1820s. Uh, we're not in the situation of uh, English workers being driven off their land into uh, Dickensian factories. That's not us, you know. Uh, and that gives us all sorts of opportunities. And in fact, you know, these have been realized to a significant extent. I mean, the, the U.S. is very different from what it was 30 years ago. Uh, it concerns like over, say, resource depletion. Those are very widely felt now. And they're big issues. Not 30 years ago. Nobody was talking about them. That's a big change. Now, whether it's a big enough change to make any difference, well, you know, nobody knows. But anyway, it's, it's a big change and in the right direction. Uh, take, say, raising money for, uh, uh, to try to compensate in some pathetic fashion for the destruction we carried out in Nicaragua. Well, it's very important. And, you know, you think about the compare it to the destruction, it's kind of a pathetic move, but it's important. But there was nothing like that 30 years ago. Nothing. We just destroyed. We didn't care about it. Uh, uh, the development of the solidarity movements in the, 18, in the 1980s was a remarkable phenomenon. It had no historical precedent. Uh, and that's a big move forward. Uh, or let's take, say, NAFTA. Uh, the, the, um, one of the, um, right after NAFTA, immediately after the NAFTA vote, uh, several U.S. corporations, including GE, I think, GE and Honeywell, uh, fired union organizers in Mexico immediately after NAFTA. Uh, workers trying to organize in, uh, unions in their factories. Well, usually the U.S. labor movement just didn't pay any attention or even supported the corporations. This time was different. For the first time, they used their own clout, which is not insignificant, to protect Mexican Union organizers. Now, this time, by now, they understand that their lives depend on it. Well, that's important. You know, that's a move, it's small, but it's a move toward the kind of international solidarity that's going to be necessary to combat uh, international, you know, international capital, basically. So these are all positive moves. The only question is timing and scale. And, you know, those are some things you don't speculate about. They're things you try to do something about. Professor Chomsky, they've written a uh, present from someone over here in the hallway. I can't see them. You mentioned that world of unemployment is 30 percent. Is the U.S. reality of said 20 to 30 percent also, or is it six, is it six to seven percent as the government claims? 
Well, the official unemployment level here is 6.4 percent. The great enthusiasm in the newspapers in the last month is it went down from 6.5 percent to 6.4 percent. Uh, this is like, you know, three times the amount that was considered tolerable about 20 years ago. Those figures are not falsified, but you have to realize what they mean. I mean, for example, they don't include people who've just given up hope. They're not on the labor market anymore. Uh, actual unemployment, if you really did a realistic measure, would probably be something like double that or maybe more. And we're one of the countries that has higher employment. So if it averages out to 30 percent over the world, you can imagine what it means elsewhere. Like take, say, Nicaragua. I mean, their unemployment is more like 60, it's like two-thirds. No. What do you think our government should do to restore our speed? What should it do? That's two different things, unfortunately. Uh, what they should do, they've always known. Uh, if they wanted to restore our steed, which they don't, uh, there are very, I think, very simple measures to do that. Uh, one measure has to do with the embargo. There's supposed to be an embargo on Haiti, uh, but that embargo is a fraud. Uh, and it's a fraud for very simple reasons. Uh, the embargo was instituted in October by the OAS, the Organization of Ranked States, in October. Uh, 1991, so it's a couple of weeks after the military coup. The U.S. technically joined it, but in February, that is three months later, uh, Bush called it off. Uh, he introduced what was called an exemption, meaning American-owned factories are exempt from the embargo. Okay, that was called fine-tuning the embargo, they called it. Uh, so quite apart from all the things that people talk about, you know, like oil getting in over the Dominican Republic, U.S. trade with Haiti just continues. Uh, and in fact, if you look at U.S. commerce figures, which I did, uh, U.S. In fact, I think I'm the only person who published them, as far as I know. Just from, you get them by calling the Commerce Department. It's not a secret. Uh, the uh, U.S. trade with Haiti last year was, you know, a little below the normal level. All right, what happened when Clinton came in? U.S. trade with Haiti increased by 50 percent. Uh, furthermore, the trade uh, expand, expanded in a new direction to food exports. Haiti is a starving island. Everybody's talking about how they're starving. They're exporting food to the United States under Clinton. They're exporting fruit and nuts to the United States. And maybe you buy it in supermarkets for all I know. Uh, well, uh, the, the, another thing they export is baseballs, big exporter of baseballs, in fact, one of the major ones. Uh, and if you look at the big American companies, they advertise their specially made baseballs, you know, hand dipped because they're so perfect. Yeah, they're hand dipped by women uh, in toxic materials uh, to make them extra good. Uh, these women uh, who will die after a couple of years from poisoning anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter, but they're, uh, they're working at an official wage of 10 cents an hour. That's if they meet the quota, which nobody can do, so they get like five cents an hour. You know, that's, that's what we're doing. And they're exporting, you know, like the, one of these corporations, I forget what it's called, something like, you know, something of champions, one of the big baseball importers, they're importing softballs and, you know, and so on from there. In fact, the U.S. government is buying them. You know, the U.S. government is one of the big purchasers of baseballs for the Army or some such thing, uh, and they're getting them from Haiti. Uh, and in fact, trade went up 50 percent under Clinton. Now, I don't know. No, nobody ever reports any of this stuff, so I'm not certain what the new embargo has, that they talk about has to do with it, but my guess is it'll continue. So one thing they could do, for example, is institute an embargo, uh, meaning we don't import fruit and nuts from Haiti produced by the super rich uh, uh, agribusiness and their local associates living in their, you know, driving around in their gold Cadillacs there. We don't do that. And we don't import baseballs for women. The women aren't getting anything, like I say, five cents an hour maybe. Uh, uh, they would be delighted if we imposed an embargo. That aside, what about the oil coming across the Dominican border? I mean, that doesn't, to stop that, it does not require bombing Santa Domingo. It requires a phone call. You know? The Dominican army is under very tight U.S. control. If we tell them, you know, stop, the, close the border, they'll close the border. Uh, if you have to threaten, you say, okay, we'll cut off the aid that keeps you alive, but I don't even think they have to threaten. They certainly don't have to invade. Uh, the Haitian military is, everyone knows, living largely off narco trafficking. Now, if you look, you'll notice that every fishing boat, you know, that has some Haitian refugees on it gets picked up by the Post Coast Guard. 
but somehow they're never able to stop a narco-trafficking boat. Actually, that question has been raised by the Black Caucus. John Conyers raised that question. He said, how come? You know, and he got an answer from the State Department or the Pentagon and so on. It was printed in the Washington Post with a straight face. Nobody seemed to crack a smile as far as I could tell. Uh, the official government answer was, well, you know, yeah, we know all this stuff is coming through, but Haiti doesn't have a, a efficient radar, and therefore they can't stop it. And, you know, naturally, the U.S. Navy and Air Force doesn't have the facilities to, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Pentagon cutbacks and so on. We certainly don't have the radar that would enable us to stop a, you know, a little motorboat coming through or a small commercial plane bringing in narcotics to keep the uh, Haitian military alive. So what can we do? You know? Well, you know, pursue it a couple of steps further. And if, it, the, if the United States wanted Aristide back, there are very simple measures that they could have taken and can take now to achieve that end. And they don't want him back. Actually, have, there's an interesting article in the New York Times this morning. If you haven't looked at it, look at it down the bottom of some page by Elaine Shalino. It reports a uh, leak from the, somebody leaked, some human rights group, in fact, somehow got hold of a cable, which must have been leaked by the, somebody in the State There are plenty of people in the State Department who don't like this policy. And in fact, they're very upset about it. And they leak things. And one of the things they leaked was a cable, actually a 10-page cable from the American Embassy in Haiti. It was printed in the Miami Herald yesterday and the Times reported today. Big 10-page ca cable, which says that uh, Aristide and the, uh, the human rights groups and the UN are all lying about the uh, human rights violations. And they give two examples, it's not mentioned in the Times, but they give two examples of things that they claim they're suspicious of. They don't say they're false, they just say they're suspicious about them. That's the proof that the human rights groups and Aristide are lying. Well, that's a 10-page cable, uh, and what it says is, you know, don't believe any of this stuff from the U.S. Embassy in Haiti to Washington. And Elaine Shalino is a good political reporter. She comments today, well, you know, this reflects the internal discussion in the White House. They won't say it publicly, but internally they dislike and distrust Aristide. That's true. They don't like him, and they don't like him for a very simple reason. Uh, he came to power on the, uh, on the basis of a popular movement. There was popular, you know, it's a very, there was, it's now largely been destroyed by violence, but there was a lively civil society with grassroots organizations and church groups and unions and all sorts of other things, blah, 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 and that just swept them to power. And that is not the kind of thing the U.S. tolerates. You don't want a populist priest who, you know, talks about reform. And in fact, he committed even worse crime. He was, he was during the seven months in office, he was very successful so successful that he even impressed the international lending organizations, which were starting to put in international money into there. And that's a U.S. assembly plant, remember. Nobody else is supposed to have fingers in it. Uh, so the, the only question was, how are they going to get rid of him? But if the U.S. wanted him to get back, uh, there would be easy ways to do it. You know, it's not a matter that calls for Marines. But, you know, the Haitians know perfectly well that the U.S. doesn't want him back. They don't have to read it in the New York Times. They know. And the Dominicans know, and so on. So the, the official culture is we call as Americans not really well. Is what? The official culture is the first of this thing is not really well uh, in terms of reporting the wealth and telling the resources of the polarizing uh, populations. Uh, in your opinion, is there in fact enough wealth and resources to support uh, polarized? You mean, can this experiment work? This experiment in which the poorest people around the world do the production and the market is the richest people around the world? Uh, I, I don't know. I Nobody knows. It's pretty safe to say that that system itself, though it's, it's uh, rolling along nicely, is incredibly corrupt. It's going oh, yeah. to run way too long uh, and probably won't go beyond too many more generations in that fashion, given the population growth and so on, uh, diminishing resources. But, uh, so, we, so we know what the problems are. We know that it's a very small portion, a very small segment of the population that's controlling the resources and so on. Uh, we, the, the large we, are at their mercy. Uh, but in fact, are there enough resources to support the general population? People? As far as anybody knows. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. And what can, what can individuals do that are not part of that uh, ruling class to 
first of all, remember that most of us are part of it. I mean, we may not feel that we're psychologically part of it, but I mean, I don't know you personally, but I can guess. Uh, that's certainly me. You know, we're part of the group that's, that's gaining from this. And let's not kid ourselves about it. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, that gives us a lot of opportunities that poor people don't have. You know, I don't think there are very many people here who are coming from the Boston slums, let's say, and I'm certainly not, uh, the, uh, which gives us plenty of opportunities that really oppressed people don't have. Uh, and and uh, there's no shortage of things we can do about it as far as activism is concerned. You just pick your topic and there are groups working on it and they can use support and help. Uh, and there's plenty, plenty of them. Uh, are there enough resources for the w world? As far as anyone knows, for example, food production is not, you know, there, there's plenty of people starving, but they're not starving because there isn't enough food in the world. They're starving because the food isn't getting to them. Food's there. In fact, a lot of these countries that have huge famines are exporting food. Yeah, often. Well, like, I mean, Haiti's a small case, you know, it's a tiny case, admittedly, but there are huge cases. I mean, right through these African famines that, you know, everybody was wailing about, uh, the same countries were exporting food. Uh, and, uh, in fact, there's plenty of food in the world. Uh, as far as other resources are concerned, well, you know, suppose it turned out, I don't think it's true, but suppose it turned out that, that there, was a, there were real resource constraints. Well, you know, one way to deal with that is for the rich to cut back on their idiotic consumption level. I mean, an enormous amount of our consumption is just forced consumption. It's not because people want it. You know, you have a drill, the advertising industry spends, you know, billions of dollars a year trying to convince people that you want to buy things, which you don't want. That's their main goal. You know, you, every, almost everybody's life would be better if you didn't have most of these things. And that's why they have to put so much effort into trying to get you to buy them. Uh, and uh, uh, so one simple thing that would increase resources is just stop wasting them. Uh, plus the fact that there's just enormous wastage. I mean, let's take, say, take the Pentagon. Uh, Pentagon spending is barely declining. Uh, Clinton's military budget is higher than Nixon's, you know, at the peak of the Cold War. And the projections are that it's going to go up in a couple of years. Well, you know, this is basically waste production, which is designed for two things. One, to maintain the profits of high technology industry through public funding, and the other to, um, you know, to set up intervention forces which will maintain control over the world. I don't think that either of those are worthwhile goals. So there's just pure, you know, that's mostly waste. Uh, we happen to have, a, I think U.S. military spending is now higher than the rest of the world combined. Uh, uh, something, I think it is, in fact. Uh, meanwhile, we're pouring arms into the third world with by far the biggest arms exporter. That's increasing. Uh, the Clinton administration is now drumming up business. And those arms are being used. You know, you look on the television set, take a look at Rwanda and so on. Yeah, the arms are being used. I mean, they happen to be French arms in that case, but it's the same story. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and they'll be used elsewhere. I mean, is this useful production? You know? I mean, when you talk about wasting resources, I mean, you can't even talk about these things. There's, there's so much vast waste going on. Uh, so there's no reason to doubt that uh, resources are available. As far as overpopulation is concerned, everyone knows the answer to that one. There's plenty of history. As, uh, as the economic situation improves, population goes down. Uh, Europe now has, a large part of Europe has negative population growth. The population of Italy, for example, is actually declining. You know, and again, well, not long ago, every family had eight children. Okay, well, these are the effects of uh, improvement in the economic situation. That's the way to cut back population growth. When you begin to have choices, well, you use them, you know. Uh, and the, the, the evidence on this is overwhelming. So I, I don't think the problems are objective. Just like the problem of a third of the population unemployed and a huge amount of work to be done, it's not a law of nature that prevents those two things from getting together. It's particular kinds of economic and social arrangements which prevent them, and they can be changed. They're human creations. They can be changed, but people don't have to work to change them. Well, now that Columbia legalized the agricultural skills, are we going to allow this to happen, or are we going to somehow the world monetary that brings this into the well, first, before we talk about Colombia, let's notice something else, which is much more important than their legalization of drugs. Uh, Colombia has now taken first place in the race for leading human rights violator in the hemisphere. It's, uh, it's, it's just monstrous. 
And not surprisingly, it's also now the leading recipient of U.S. military aid under Clinton. That's going up. You know. uh, that's, again, not surprising. That's the way it works. Uh, if you took uh, the, uh, there was the uh, International Labor Organization, again, just a couple of weeks ago, published a list of uh, murdered union leaders around the world. Around the world. Half of them were for, from Colombia. Around the world. The Committee to Protect Journalists just listed the journalists killed around the world. I forget the proportion, but by far the largest number were from Colombia. Of course, the main victims are peasants, as always. I mean, they're getting slaughtered. Uh, about 20,000 people have been killed in the last couple of years, and it's going up. Uh, so that's Colombia. Worst human rights violator in the hemisphere, getting worse, leading recipient of U.S. military aid. I mean, speak of resources. Uh, and this is mostly a criminalized protest. That's basically what it's going for. You know, death squads and torture, the whole usual story. About the drug thing, uh, Colombia's move in legalizing drugs makes perfect sense. I mean, the problem in the drug trade is not Colombia. You know, it's the market. And the market's mostly here. Uh, and the, uh, actually here, too, probably the right move is some form of decriminalization. I mean, you know, you can argue about the details, but a lot of the criminalization of drugs here has nothing to do with, the dr with drugs. It has to do with controlling people. I mean, in fact, if you look at the way the prison rate is going up, a very large part of that is for victimless crimes. You know, some teenage kid is caught with a joint in his pocket or something. Okay, go to jail for a couple of years. That keeps him off the streets. Uh, that's the, uh, I think, I forget the numbers, but like 25% or some huge amount of the uh, prison population is that. Uh, and that, uh, it's interesting that the, the um, substances, you know, the harmful substances that are criminalized are those that are used by the poor, not by the rich. So alcohol is much more harmful than cocaine, but alcohol is not criminalized because that's for the rich. Uh, cocaine is criminalized, that's the poor. I mean, most of these things have a class basis, they don't have much to do with drugs. No oh. intensity warfare, the score of the Americans, by the way, about a juice class now. Yeah. Could you comment on our training at Fort Benning? Uh, yeah. Well, Father uh, Roy Bourgeois, who's running that program, yeah, was arrested there. Yeah, for, I mean, actually, Joe Kennedy here is one of the senators who've been trying to close that thing down. I mean, they have a terrible record. You know, for example, the military leadership in Colombia comes from there, or in Haiti. You know, the military leadership in Haiti comes from there. Uh, every single one of them was trained there. Actually, according to Father Bourgeois, who I spoke to about this a little while ago, uh, he claimed he's mon they're monitoring the School of the Americas there. He's the, he said that, uh, according to church sources, there, there are, they saw Haitian officers there as recently as last October. Uh, I can't vouch for that, but that's actually been reported in the church press. He sent me some uh, coming from church sources, monitoring. So, yeah, I mean, that place ought to be closed down. should have been a long time ago. But, but, you know, low-intensity warfare, incidentally, is just another name for international terrorism. That's not a joke. If you look at the, I've actually, I've published some things on this, if you're interested, in which I simply took the U.S. legal code, you know, the, the official criminal code, in which they define uh, international terrorism, and then I compared it with the army manuals in which they define low-intensity warfare, and they're identical. You know, it's the same thing. It's just when we do it, we call it low-intensity warfare. When somebody else does it, we call it international terrorism. Yeah. Yeah, there are, I, I have two, uh, two parts. I just wanted to make a brief comment. There are socially responsible corporations. Maybe we can encourage the growth and formation of more than, I think of two as an example, Ben and Jerry's and Reebok. Um, both New England companies, too. Well, let's take Reebok. Okay, let me take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Reebok is doing some interesting things yeah. trying to stop uh, the misuse of child labor and, and those things and, and prison labor and so forth. Um, the, uh, the other comment is if, if, if capital flows to where the labor is going to be cheaper, then why aren't, isn't it flowing into countries like Nicaragua? Because uh, the U.S. will not let it. The U.S. see, in order, capital is going to flow to places where there's infrastructure and, and and you know foreign aid coming in and people you know build roads and so on. The U.S. won't let that happen. We're strangling them. I mean, when they've been tortured enough, then capital will start flowing in there. But they haven't been tortured enough. That's a political purpose. 
in my opinion. Same with Cuba. They've got to be tortured because people have to be taught a lesson. There are more important, there are plenty of poor places where you can send, uh, uh, you know, you can send factories. In fact, one of them, to get back to Reebok, is Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia has some of the worst labor conditions in the world. Uh, it ha its wages in Indonesia are half the level of China uh, and way below Thailand. And that's where Reebok sends its work to. They're using, uh, one of the reasons why Reebok has these human rights groups is to try to cover up what they're doing, uh, which is in fact exploiting extremely, uh, exploiting labor under horrifying conditions. Uh, not only does Indonesia have it, one of the reasons why Indonesia has such cheap labor is they don't have any unions. Actually, they have a union. It's a state union. You, know, you can be a member of the state union if you like. You know, it's like Russia. Uh, <clears throat> but there's no independent unions. That's not allowed. And in fact, people try to form them, they just get killed. Uh, well, same with Nike. You know, a lot of the sneakers and things are made in Indonesia, in fact. Uh, so, you know, when you talk about socially responsible corporation, I think you have to be, for the concept of a socially responsible corporation is almost a self-contradiction. Now, I don't want to push it too hard, you know, like you don't have to be involved in torture and murder. But the fact is that if you are in the corporate world, you know, you can be the nicest person in the world, you know, but if you're the CEO of a corporation, your job is to maximize profit and market share. And if you don't do that, you are not going to be the CEO of the corporation tomorrow, because somebody else will be, and the investment funds will go somewhere else. And when that's your job, to maximize profit and market share, there's a very limited range in which you can be socially responsible. I mean, I admit there's some range, you know, but not a lot. But then these guidelines that they came out with, the, with the, they, uh, about the use of foreign labor are... They really look at the cases. Like Levy, I haven't looked at this one yet, but Levy Strauss claims, I haven't checked it, that, in, uh, that under pressure, you know, under pressure from shareholders and so on, uh, they did work to uh, reduce in child labor in Bangladesh, which is one place they were producing those things. And that could be true. I mean, you know, you want to check it out and see if it's true. Uh, but if these things are true, they, and that they're worth pressing, you know, it is worth pressing corporations at shareholder meetings and so on to do something. Uh, on the other hand, we shouldn't de delude ourselves about it. There's a very limited range, not because they're bad people, you know, but because that's the way the institutions are. Like if you or I were CEO, we couldn't do anything very different or we wouldn't remain. You know, there are the requirement that, I mean, here I agree with Milton Friedman. You know, corporations cannot be humanitarian institutions. They must be what I would call terrorist institutions, uh, designed to maximize profit for their shareholders, independent of what happens to human beings. And if they don't do that, they're not in the game any longer. I mean, it's a system that's, there's a, there's a, this, the system is designed that way. It works that way. It was set up that way. And that leaves very little why, leeway. Why would, you know, you, you the Eastern Europe under communism is one of the worst polluters in the world. That's right. It, it, it just, like other, just like other third world industrializing societies. So Eastern Europe under communism was very much like Mexico City and Santiago. Now that's what industrializing societies are like. That's what we were like when we were an early industrializing society. Now, I mean, that's what Britain was like. You know, you, I mean, look, as recently as the 1960s, you know, not very long ago, I mean, I remember very well going to London and not being able to breathe, you know? I mean, now they sort of cleaned up their act. But as early as the early 60s, as late as the early 60s, that's after like, uh, you know, 150 years of the Industrial Revolution, you still couldn't breathe in London. Okay, when countries get rich enough, you know, they start externalizing the pollution. But when they're just developing, they pollute like mad. I mean, our, you know, this was such a big, rich country that it didn't show very much. I mean, we had unusual advantages. Once the native population was exterminated, you know, and you didn't pay attention to slaves and so on, if you look at the rest, there's this huge country with enormous resources, you know, kind of like a paradise, and people coming in, okay, you could pollute like mad and you didn't notice it. That's, you don't have that, you don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't have those options in countries that are industrializing today, so you see it. Uh, but if in a place like Santiago, Chile, or Mexico City, it's, you know, you, uh, these are some of the most polluted places in the world. Eastern Europe was, you know, hell-bent on uh, rapid industrialization under a tyrannical system, that had absolutely nothing to do with socialism or anything else, and yeah, you get some of the worst consequences anywhere there. I mean, that went along with very high level of industrialization. They pulled themselves out of the third world. 
but at a huge environmental cost and human cost. If human dignity and supplement it, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Uh, furthermore, everyone has a right to form and to join trade unions for the protection of his interests. And so I remember this is 1948, so the reference to himself and his family uh, reflects the consciousness of that day, not this day. There's been some improvements. Uh, well, again, that's, uh, that's part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we uphold against all comers, uh, against third world countries with their cultural relativism, has the force of law in the United States. Uh, just take a look at the last part. Everyone has a right to form and join trade unions. Technically, there is such a right in the United States, but that's just a technical right. There's an array of legal uh, and other administrative uh, conditions which have essentially eroded that right, uh, and it doesn't in fact exist. In fact, the United States uh, was brought before the uh, International Labor Organization about two years ago and condemned for its violation of the right to form unions. It's very rare for the ILO to condemn an industrial country. Almost never happens. Uh, the, United it, the United States was the only country at that time outside of South Africa in the industrial world uh, that allowed the use of strike breakers uh, to undermine the uh, permanent replacement workers, we call them here, scabs, in other words, to uh, undermine the right of workers to, uh, uh, to the rights guaranteed by Article 23. Uh, the, uh, that's, uh, the destruction of unions in the United States, which has proceeded quite significantly since the, since the 1930s, uh, that since, since workers finally run one in the 1930s, the rights that they had in most of the rest of the world and had, had for a long time, but that was very quickly eroded. Uh, and uh, by now, unions are reduced to fairly marginal phenomenon. And that's had a very significant effect. Uh, one effect that it's had is on lowering wages. So Lawrence Katz, who's the chief economist of the US Labor Department, recently suggested that that's the main fact, that the destruction of unions is probably the main factor in the very sharp uh, reduction of wages that's taken place in the United States. Uh, now to the lowest level in the industrial world. I'll return to that. Uh, the, uh, uh, another effect of the elimination of unions uh, is in violation of Article 23 is uh, just undermining of uh, democratic processes generally. Uh, unions are, after all, one of the few mechanisms by which uh, poor uh, people, ordinary people, can get together to advance their own concerns and interests in the political arena. Uh, when they do so, incidentally, that arouses uh, considerable uh, antagonism, even hysteria. That just happened a couple of months ago. <clears throat> I'll come back to that. It was an interesting incident. Uh, uh, aside from uh, reducing wages and undermining democratic processes, the, the <clears throat> elimination or marginalization of unions uh, has a kind of a psychological effect. It's part of a much more general and quite significant process of uh, privatizing aspirations, that is, of undermining the idea that you should have concern for others, uh, undermining a sense of solidarity and sympathy and uh, an idea that so, you, know, you were all in together, we have to work together. It's very important to atomize people and separate them from... that thing was going to tip over when I stepped on it. Uh, okay, yeah, I made it. <laughs> well, that uh, title was picked to be broad enough to include just about anything. Uh, and uh, maybe a good starting point is uh, human rights. Uh, there, at least, there's a well-accepted standard, so uh, codified, uh, in fact, universally accepted, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights passed by the General Assembly of the United Nations unanimously in December 1948, has the force of, recognized as having the force of law in the United States. Uh, furthermore, the United States has been uh, very prominent in defending the principle of the universality of the, uh, of the Universal Declaration. You'll recall last year there was a big conference in Vienna with a lot of publicity and uh, very impassioned rhetoric. Uh, the U.S. was taking the lead in defending the principle of universality against various 
backward third world countries that were claiming that uh, this was a, that these were Western standards which didn't apply to them. And the U.S. was denouncing this cultural relativism and finally won a grand victory and the Universal Declaration was again endorsed. Uh, that uh, rhetoric is rarely besmirched by any look at uh, what, the, what the text says, and it's an interesting text. There's a lot to say about it. Uh, for example, the, there are articles of the Declaration that have quite direct bearing on things happening right now, for example, in the Caribbean and in the Middle East. If there's time later, I could talk about that, but I'll just, time's short, so I'll just keep to some of the articles, parts of the Declaration that have a much broader significance and that tie in with the larger topics that I want to review a bit. Uh, so let's have a look first at uh, Article 25, for example. Article 25 says that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security of security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Well, that's Article 25, and I won't waste any time discussing how that principle is upheld in the richest country in the world with absolutely unparalleled advantages, so certainly no reason why it cannot be adhered to in full, a country that has a poverty level twice as high as any other in the industrial world, that has uh, millions of children suffering malnutrition uh, under third world conditions, uh, and other uh, phenomena that are familiar to you or that you can easily see by taking a walk in the nearest city. Well, that's Article 25, so we plainly are defending the validity of that one. Uh, so let's have a look at Article 23. It says, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. Uh, with, uh, with equal pay for equal work and just and favorable re remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy. To the second annual Social Action uh, Lecture Series here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Marblehead. My name is Tony Toledo Buff. We're a liberal religious group. We've got this idea that has sprouted to have different people come over here and speak as a community service. Now, to me, it's very amazing that this woman standing here is able to call different folks. Last year, we had inaugurated our series with Howard Zinn, and our delightful speaker tonight, Jackie, had contacted, wrote letters, and he's agreed to come over. So to introduce our speaker, Jackie Wattenberg. This is going to be a night to remember. We've been waiting for this for so long. Professor Chomsky has spoken all around the world. There's hardly a country that he has missed in his speaking tours, or I should say has inv not invited him to speak there. And his books have been translated all around the world. He's an eminent professor of linguistics at MIT, as many of you know. His books are used in colleges as textbooks all around the world. As a matter of fact, my daughter uses textbook book in the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, his books are are numerous, he's a very prolific writer. Besides linguistics, he writes about, of course, political philosophy, uh, international affairs, public policy, the politics of oppression anywhere in the world. A sampling of his books, by the way, are right up here on the table. Afterwards, if you'd like to look at them and buy some, he will be willing to sign them for you this evening after the lecture. Uh, when his books are published, they're usually re uh, reviewed all around the world, in many countries, such as Canada, England, Ireland, even Japan. There are two countries, though, that have been a little bit neglectful in reviewing his books through the years, the Soviet Union and the United States. <laughs> his honors are really too many to cite, but I'll tell you just a few. He has honorary degrees from the University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, University of London, he had the Distinguished Science Award in 1984. He received the Kyoto Award in Japan in 1988, the George Orwell Award, and he has been the Bertrand Russell Memorial Lecturer at Cambridge in England, the Nehru Memorial Lecturer in New Delhi, the John Locke Lecturer at Oxford, 
and a research fellow at Harvard's Cognitive Study Center. Now, if you're like me, you may have been perturbed at certain things occurring in our country through the recent years, or through many years, the Vietnam War, the Panama War, the Gulf War, NAFTA, these things you are concerned about and you think, well, it's sort of an aberration. Uh, it won't happen again. We'll try to stop this. But since I've been acquainted with the writing of Noam Chomsky and hear him on tape and in, the, in the lectures, I realize that he has seen through his brilliant insights a sort of large glowing arc that ties all the incidents together and really defines and glues the purpose <coughs> and the intent of all these actions. So I'm very happy that he's going to speak to us tonight on an exciting topic. We'll never know exactly what it is until he gets delves into it. Bringing the third world home, democracy and human rights in the new world order. Noam Chomsky. One another and privatize their uh, their goals and aspirations for as a technique of social control that's of great significance uh, and uh, undermining unions is one of many uh, uh, many elements of that ideological offensive of which everyone is should be is or should be familiar well uh, coming back to the a matter of uh, article 23 everyone has the right to work and free choice of employment and so on the International Labor Organization just uh, came out with a uh, an analysis of the world employment situation. They estimate that 30% of the world's labor force is now unemployed as of January 1994. Uh, unemployed means, and like maybe they can sell, you know, postcards at a street corner or something, but that means not enough, uh, 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 not enough work to uh, sustain uh, a uh, minimal standard of living. That's what unemployed means. So that's 30% of the world's labor force. Well, that's worse than the 1930s. They compare it to the great crisis, the crisis of the Great Depression. In fact, it's worse. Uh, it's one part of a huge human rights catastrophe, uh, which shows up in all sorts of ways. Uh, UNESCO estimated that about half a million children die every year simply from debt service alone, uh, repaying the, the debts are. Uh, the loans are from U.S. Or, and other commercial banks to their favorite dictators. Uh, when the debts go sour, they have to be paid for by the poor people of those countries and incidentally by U.S. taxpayers uh, because remember that the banks don't believe in the free market. Uh, they believe in it for others, but for themselves they believe in socialism. So when, the bad, when debts are bad, they're socialized in various ways and the costs are distributed over the general population. Uh, but in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, they pay, uh, and they pay for it badly, for example, with half a million children dying every year. Uh, 11 World Health Organization estimates 11 million children dying every year uh, simply from very easily tra tra treatable diseases, things like childhood diarrhea, which you could treat for a couple of cents, uh, and they're dying because uh, the rich folk don't want to pay for it or don't even want to know about it. The head of the World Health Organization described that as a silent genocide, and indeed we would have absolutely no hesitation in describing those practices as genocidal if we could blame them on someone else. Uh, when we can blame them on ourselves, we don't talk about them. Uh, in Eastern Europe, since 1989, since it uh, uh, re returned to the free world, uh, the uh, one thing is free at least, there's been a free fall of the economy into deep third world conditions. Uh, UNESCO again came out with a report just recently estimating the human effects of the, what are called the reforms in Eastern Europe. Uh, they estimate that in Russia alone there's half a million extra deaths a year simply as a result of the reforms, comparable numbers elsewhere. Uh, the term reform is an interesting one. Refor reform is of course a good thing. If something's a reform, naturally everyone's in favor of it. Uh, and so those who might advocate a different way for these societies to be taken, drawn out of the Soviet tyranny, uh, they are reactionaries or maybe communists or against reforms and obviously bad people. So that, uh, that issue is, is settled by mere choice of terminology. And if half a million people die a year from it in Russia, well, you know, it's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, there is something called a recovery going on in the United States, although it was announced by the government today that they're worried that it's going too fast, so they're going to terminate it. 
Uh, this is the Clinton recovery. It's about half the rate of normal recoveries, post-war recoveries, uh, and it's had about a third the rate of job growth uh, after the previous six recessions. Uh, among those jobs, uh, the jobs are also overwhelmingly low-income jobs, so incomes of wages have continued to drop. Uh, furthermore, there's a huge number of temporary uh, employees. In 1992, about 27% of the new jobs were temps. Uh, the uh, uh, figures for uh, this April were just released. Uh, you sure saw them, they were front page stories, but you had to go down to the bottom about how wonderful the job creation was, though in fact much lower than after other post-war recessions. Uh, but in fact, the number of temporary jobs was still one out of six, and furthermore, they expected to continue that way. Uh, temporary jobs means uh, that's, it, uh, it does, uh, that's another good thing. That improves what's called the flexibility of the labor market. It's a technical term for it. Flexibility means, is a fancy word for insecurity. It means you don't know if you're going to have a job tomorrow morning when you go to sleep at night. And that's a good thing, as any economist can explain. Uh, it improves what's called economic health. Economic health is a technical term that means things are good for profits, not necessarily for people. Uh, and in fact, for people, they're pretty rotten, but for profits, they're great. The uh, last uh, Fortune review of the welfare of corporations uh, was just glowing with praise for the uh, enormous increase in, in profits last year, again, even above the preceding year. So something's doing well. Uh, there's uh, 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 not only are, have uh, wages been stagnating and, in fact, declining, uh, but in fact, but uh, w the workload is also increasing. Uh, American workers did finally win a 40-hour week in the 1930s, but they lost it very fast. That's a thing of the past. Uh, by now, uh, Julie Shore, who's written one of the most recent economists at Harvard, has done most of the work on this, uh, estimates that workers have to work about six weeks extra a year to maintain their 1970 salaries. And if you look at yesterday's figures, you'll again notice that the uh, average workload has reached new post-war heights. Uh, well, it's claimed that all of this has to do with uh, market forces. It's just inexorable kind of laws of nature. And then people, our economists, argue about whether the main effect is due to international trade or to automation. Those are the two. Uh, those are the two favorite candidates for the market forces that are causing all of this. Uh, well, that discussion is at best misleading and uh, at worst maybe verging on fraud, in my opinion. Uh, if you look at the, these factors, trade and automation, let's say, uh, both of them are only in very small, in, in part, you could argue about what part, but in part at least, uh, 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 market phenomena. A trade, for example, is supposed to be efficient. Everybody learns that. Uh, but the efficiency of trade uh, is achieved by overlooking 